and welcome to Huts of the Huskies third Dog Science Explained video and this week's video is going to look at the scientific evidence around different training techniques. Now there are three different types as I'm sure you're aware. There are re reward based trainers who work with the way in which dogs learn which is by association. So you, if you reward the dog for doing something he'll likely do it again because it's pleasant to do. And they tackle problem behaviours on a case-by-case -case basis by attempting to deal with the underlying issues. And then there are punishment-based trainers who, again, work with associative learning, but instead use punishment. So they either remove an uncomfortable element, so maybe a tight leash, to encourage a behaviour, or they give a punishment, say a spray of water, to discourage a behaviour. And finally, there's dominance training which says that dogs misbehave due to them not knowing their place within the pack. And they deal with problem behaviours by teaching the dog that the owner is the alpha. Now, the way this is done is again using punishment, such as the five-finger kind of bite simulation, um, because dominance trainers believe this is the way an alpha disciplines his pack in the wild. Alternatively, they may reward the dog for submissive behaviour by removing a negative stimulus, such as pinning the dog down and letting him up when he's calm and submissive. Now, because these last two use the same techniques, i.e. they both use punishment and negative reinforcement, for the purposes of this video, I'll use the terms punishment or negative-based training and dominance training to mean the same thing. Now, first of all, we're going to look at whether punishment-based or dominance-based training works. And one study by Yeon, 1999, found that a combination of rewarding a dog for eliminating inappropriate places and punishing them when they soiled in the house was effective to toilet train the dog. Now, I've seen this cited as evidence that punishment works in several places. However, take note that both reward and punishment were used and therefore it's impossible to know whether both or just one was the actual reason the dog learned the behaviour. The next study by Mashark and Banger, 2002, concluded that punishment was effective for training sheepdogs to herd rather than hunt. Now, the authors concluded that punishment was the most effective method, but what you need to know is they didn't use positive punishment, but negative reinforcement. And the difference is positive punishment is the conventional type where you give a negative stimulus, such as a jerk on the lead or a shock by a shock collar, Negative reinforcement is where you remove something that the dog likes, and actually what they did was more of a neutral training technique. So if the collie made a mistake, they stopped them and took them away from the sheep. So this is the same as ignoring your dog for jumping up. You're not actively punishing the dog, you're basically giving them no reinforcement whatsoever, and then you're giving a positive reinforcement, so allowing them to herd the sheep, when they give the behaviour that you want them to do. So be careful of studies like these because obviously there's a big difference between this kind of punishment and, say, using a shock collar. And this brings us on to our next study by Christiansen et al., 2001, who used shock collars to train gun dogs to ignore sheep. And they found that it was effective after a year of use in dogs that had previously ch chased sheep and the owners of the dogs reported no negative side effects. However, Hibby et al., 2004, questioned 364 dog owners about the methods they had used to teach seven tasks, which were toilet training, not to chew household objects, come, leave, sit, and stay. The methods were then categorised into reward-based, so toys, food, and praise, and punishment-based, so physical and verbal punishment. The owners were then asked how many, if any, of 16 common behavioural problems their dogs showed, and then to rate the obedience of their dogs for the seven tasks on a scale of one to five, and then rate their dog's overall obedience. Subsequently, the number of times owners reported using punishment and reward was added up to give a frequency of method for each dog, and the obedience scores of each dog were added up to give a summed obedience, and these two were compared. And what the researchers found was, those owners who used the most reward-based techniques rated their dogs as the most obedient, and owners who used more punishment reported their dogs showed more problem behaviours. So basically, as the amount of reward training increased, the level of obedience increased. As the amount of punishment increased, the amount of problem behaviours increased. Another interesting finding was that 
Dog owners who reported using punishment in response to dogs chewing and toileting were left alone had dogs that showed the highest levels of separation anxiety. Now this study is supported by a second study by Casey et al. 2014 who again, using questionnaires, looked at several factors, including training method and whether a dog had shown aggressive behaviour. And what Casey et al. found was the use of punishment or negative reinforcement was linked to an increased chance of dogs showing aggression. In fact, dogs who had been punished were more than double as likely to have growled, bitten, lunged or barked at family members, strangers and visitors to the home than dogs trained using positive reinforcement. However, bear in mind that both the two studies we've just discussed measured correlation, not causation, which means it's possible that dogs that showed poor initial obedience or aggression behaviour initiated more punishment from their owners. But it's important to remember that even if this is the case, it was ineffective, as increased punishment didn't lead to a more obedient dog. And if we look at a study by Blackwell et al. 2008, which didn't use correlations, we find a similar thing. So owners were asked to score 36 problem behaviours in their dogs on a scale of zero, never happened, to four, happens frequently, and then what kind, if any, of training the dog had received. Now, the use of solely positive reinforcement was associated with the least incidences of problem behaviour. And if we look at the breakdown of these, positive reinforcement only, represented by these bars here, resulted in the least control problems, so things like not coming back when called, which basically means dogs trained using rewards had higher obedience, and reward-based training also led to the least incidences of aggression, fear and avoidance, and attention-seeking behaviour. So the real question is, does training method have a direct, measurable effect on dogs' behaviour? And again, all these three studies were questionnaires, so it's possible they're not completely reliable. So what we're going to look at now is direct observational and experimental studies. So Daladell and Gonnet, 2014, observed two separate dog training classes which used different methods. The first school used positive reinforcement, so the giving of a treat or toy. The second used negative reinforcement, which means the removal of an aversive stimulus. So, for example, sit in the positive class was taught by using a food law and then giving a treat when the dog performed the correct action. In the negative class, it was taught by holding the lead up high so that it put pressure on the dog's neck and pushing down hard on the backside. And when the dog sat, it was rewarded by the removal of these two unpleasant pressures. The two classes were compared for the amount of stress and attentive behaviours the dog showed throughout the whole series of classes and then when commanded to walk to heel and when commanded to sit. So if we look at when the dogs were asked to walk to heel, the dark bars represent the number of dogs which displayed the behaviour in the negative class and the light bars represent the number of dogs who displayed the behaviour in the positive class. So as you can see, Low body posture, which is known in canine behaviour to be a social signal, which dogs use to appease either another dog or a person, essentially an attempt to avoid an attack or avoid a punishment, and it's also known to be a sign of fear and anxiety, was higher in the negatively class. But the author of this paper found that this difference was not what's called statistically significant, which basically means that it may have just occurred by random chance, there wasn't enough of a difference between the two to be absolutely sure there really was a difference, which is why it doesn't have an asterisk. However, the most interesting part of this graph is the second bar, which shows that dogs taught using rewards watched their owners while walking to heel a lot more than dogs taught using negative reinforcement. And if we look at when dogs were asked to sit, we find the same again, only this time significantly more dogs in the negatively class showed fear. And here you can see dogs were much more focused on their owners in the positively class. And finally, if we look at the behaviour of the dogs in each class across the whole of the training course, there were significantly more signs of anxiety and stress shown by the dogs in the negative class than in the positive. 
And the conclusion drawn by the authors was that not only did negative reinforcement make dogs anxious, but that dogs trained using rewards were more attentive to their owners, which we'll see from the next two studies is important for obedience and the dog's ability to learn subsequent tasks. Haverbeck et al. 2008 observed the way military dogs were trained. Now, the use of harsh training methods in military dogs is common practice, and Haverbeck et al. observed the training methods used by the handler and the performance of the dog at eight obedience tasks, such as sit, down, come and heal, and then at five tasks, which they had to perform in their role as military dogs, such as attack, stand off, which basically means don't attack, and release, which means let go of someone they've already bitten, and then defend the handler. The performance of each dog was calculated as the number of tasks the dog completed successfully. And what they found was dogs which received the most punishment for incorrect behaviour had the lowest performance in both obedience and working tasks, and importantly, were the most distracted during training sessions. And how they measured distraction was the amount of time the dog was looking at, therefore presumably focusing on, the handler or the task, so the threat to the handler. So again, like in the last study, punishment-based techniques made dogs less attentive towards their owners, and this study also supports the questionnaires which found dogs trained using punishment are least obedient. The next study by Rooney and Coan, 2011, looked at the impact of training method on how dogs behaved in their own homes. So they asked owners about the methods they had used to train their dog, and then they filmed the reactions of the dog to a visitor entering the home, the owner initiating play, and the dog's ability to learn a new command, which was to touch target. They found owners who had used more punishment-based techniques had dogs that were less playful, less likely to choose to interact with their owners, and less likely to interact with a visitor. And also owners who used more reward-based methods had dogs that performed better at learning to touch the target, regardless of the method that was actually used to teach them that new command. So basically what this tells us is the use of punishment in previous training meant the dog was less successful at learning a new command, possibly due to anxiety around training because of the expectation of punishment but also possibly just because they were less motivated to interact with people. And this reduced learning ability, coupled with inattention and a general lack of wanting to interact with the owner, could explain why dogs trained using punishment have been found to be less obedient. Finally, we're going to look at the risks, physical rather than behavioural, of punishment-based training. And I'm going to use a specific example, and I've chosen this example simply because it's been well studied. So I'm going to use the evidence for and against using a choke chain or a slip lead and holding the dog up in the air so the chain or lead tightens around the dog's neck. Now the idea of this method is to take the fight out of the dog and to teach him to submit to you so essentially you calm him down. But what do we find if we look at the scientific evidence? Now three studies have looked at the effectiveness of this technique and they all found that it led to an aggressive response which escalated. The dog became more and more aggressive until finally they did calm down. However, the scientists found that this calm behaviour was linked to critically low oxygen levels and the calm submissive response was actually due to them entering an unconscious or semi-unconscious state brought on by oxygen deprivation. And the scientists also observed that the aggressive behaviour of the dogs would go way beyond anything the dogs would show normally, and instead of being a struggle to assert their dominance, was caused simply because the dog is being strangled, and its survival response to something so life-threatening is causing it to try and attack. And what they found was the majority of dogs were actually attempting to attack the lead, not the handler. And the most interesting finding was that if you lower the dog to the floor while it's still in that escalated aggressive state, the aggression would stop instantly. So the dog was not what dominance called calm submissive when it was lowered, but the moment that strangulation stopped, it ceases to fight. Now, what this shows us is it's not that the dog is fighting for dominance, otherwise when lowered before it offered submission, it would attack the handler. And when the dogs were examined by a vet, they, f they were found to have damage not only externally, but also internally to their windpipes. 
Now, there was a case study recently at the Justice Lee Big University Department of Veterinary Clinical Sciences Small Animal Clinic, and Gro Manitel 2013 published a paper on it. A German shepherd was brought to the clinic because he was walking in circles, he was very unresponsive and disorientated, and the vets quickly realised he had also gone blind. And the owner said that the dog had been punished for not obeying a command by being held up by his choke chain for approximately 50 seconds. And a subsequent brain scan revealed multiple brain lesions, and the dog was also showing clear signs of pain and anxiety so he was panting excessively his heart rate was 140 beats per minute and he had a temperature of 40 degrees and they did try a variety of treatments on him but nothing was ever going to reverse that damage and none of the treatments they tried made him any more comfortable and in the end he was euthanized now of course this is a very extreme case but it just highlights the danger of using techniques and shows how the explanations of behaviours which trainers sometimes give can have alternative explanations which may be more supported by the evidence. Now, another aspect that makes punishment or dominance techniques so dangerous is that they can teach dogs to bite without warning, which was shown by Landsberg et al. 2003. And basically, the punishment suppresses the performance of growling and snarling as the dog reduces these behaviours to avoid punishment, but it doesn't deal with the underlying issue and it may actually make a dog more aggressive by reinforcing that the object of his aggression is a bad thing. So, for example, if a dog is dog aggressive and you smack it each time it sees another dog because it growls, the dog may stop growling, but from the dog's perspective, dog now equals smack and the negative association is reinforced and the dog's emotional state is made worse and he's now more likely to attack even though through punishment he's been trained not to growl. And the last thing we're going to look at is the safety of the handler of the dog when using various techniques to correct behaviour. Heron et al. 2009 looked at the reaction of dogs with various behavioural problems to different techniques used in an attempt to correct them. And this shows what they found. So this graph shows the number of owners who had attempted the particular confrontational or dominance techniques. And each bar shows the number of dogs who responded to the training with aggression, here in blue, and the number who didn't, here in white. Now, if you're thinking that actually the percentage of dogs that show aggression is actually quite low, compare it to this graph, which shows the same thing except for positive techniques. So a massively lower number of dogs reacted aggressively to these non-confrontational corrective methods. And bear in mind, if you look at the data for just dogs with aggressive problems, 100% of them reacted aggressively to certain dominance techniques, such as the alpha role. So basically what this shows is that aversive dominance techniques cause aggression more than positive or neutral techniques and this makes them very unsafe for the owner of the dog and anyone else close by. So to recap, punishment based training has been shown to work in some circumstances as it does reduce the frequency of unwanted behaviour because the dog will seek to avoid the aversive stimulus. And some studies have found no adverse effects of dominance or negatively training. However, it does not seem to lead to higher levels of, of obedience, nor does it always prevent an aggressive response. Furthermore, dogs trained using aversive or dominance techniques are much less attentive to their owners, less interactive with people, and tend to be less obedient which suggests punishment and negative reinforcement cause the dog to become anxious around the owner, leading to an unwillingness to participate in training because they are afraid of the punishment, which then leads to decreased training success and decreased ability to learn new tasks. Finally, certain techniques used by dominance trainers, while billeted as asserting yourself as the alpha, can actually be better explained by associative learning and natural survival responses, and can have severe risks of injury to both trainer and dog. And the last point I'd like to make that while both techniques work, we can see that they work, reward-based or associative training can explain why dominance training works through negative associations, decreasing behavior, but dominance training can't explain why reward-based training works. 
So what do you think? What conclusions would you draw from this evidence? And as always, if you know some evidence I've missed, I'd love to read it. Please let me know. Uh, I f hope you find this interesting and thanks for watching.